The worm skull throne is a broad seated and high arch backed throne fashioned of polished obsidian. It rests on oversized feet which are the impaled skulls of four great elder blue dragons, their horns intact. Barely visible runes glisten in the carved obsidian, winking to life with blue energy when the throne's powers are active, and there is a small indentation at the end of the right arm rest, wherein should rest a ruling scepter of Shanatar, the ancient empire of all shielded dwarves. The throne is an artifact ancient created by the dwarven god Dumathoin. It exists and was created to mark a tremendous victory for the dwarven people against the city of Soaring Shadows, the largest settlement of an evil monster species called Cloakers beneath the marching mountains and the surface realm of Kalimshan. Okay, that was a lot to take in, so let's start off nice and simple. The dwarves arrived in the historical record on the world of Toril 17,496 years ago. This was 1,600 years before the catastrophic elven high magic ritual called the Sundering, which created the Evermeet Islands and broke the continent of Faerun into the form it remains in to this day. Perhaps it was this dramatic cataclysm that forced the dwarven species to migrate to the very top of the stone world below. But for the first dwarves, living in the upper dark and visiting the surface world was like building a base at Mount Everest and going for scouting missions on the moon. For thousands of years, their worldview was that things happening on the surface of the world were far less important than the exploration, wars and politics of the world below. Early dwarven society was a subterranean one. They were rarely seen on the surface. The dwarves first showed up in the Yehamol Mountains and over the next thousand years migrated through the upper dark caves, caverns and river networks with a large number settling and founding a mighty civilization within the great cavern of Berendin, located under the Shah Plains. Meanwhile, the elven civilization, largely ignored by the dwarves, plunged into four generations of unhinged conflict known as the Crown Wars, during which, 12,496 years ago, a dwarf champion known as the Crusader, Tark Shanat, departed the great cavern of Berendin for a new land far to the east. He left with his eight sons and discovered an excellent territory with incredible resources and opportunities for his people. But it was dominated by a very evil and powerful species of non-humanoid creatures called Cloakers, allied with many evil dragons and other monsters of the world below. The main reason for this mass migration was the arrival of the Mine Flayers on Toril from the planet Glyph, and their founding of the city named Orindal. The dwarves knew damned well that this was extremely bad news, and were proven quite correct as the Mine Flayers had been formidable enemies of theirs over thousands of years since. Tark was called the Crusader for a damn good reason, and his entire clan went to war against staggering odds mind you, with the ancient and evil civilization of strictly hierarchical demon-summoning cloakers ruled by a group of twelve cloaker lords known as the Shadow Orb Conclave. To this day, this era was known as the Cloaker Wars, and it began 12,296 years ago. The battle where Tark Shanat became a legendary hero took place on a plateau called Ringlor Noroth, that is both the site of the city of Soaring Shadows and something else, much older and very evil. You see, the ruling Shadow Orb Conclave took their orders from a mysterious being known only as the Emissary, who came from a twin city located in the exact location in the Shadowfell dimension. And there is this massive, very ancient broken stone arch bridge called the Shadowspan soaring over this lake, which some time long ago was connected to the other lake in the Shadowfell permanently. The Cloakers sought to rebuild this bridge, but the Dwarves stopped it with extreme violence and the righteous power of their gods. On this site of victory, from the skulls of four ancient blue dragons that Tark had killed, a magical artifact was created and gifted to Tark and the bloodline of Clan Shanat. He founded the settlement of al Torin on the site, including the fabled Brightaxe Hall. According to the legend, on that spot where the hall is located, Tark and his sons battled four blue dragons, and when Tark struck the fatal blow on the last of them, the entire rocky plateau the Cloaker City was built on rung out like a chiming crystal, and from the stone rose the obsidian throne underneath Tark, rising into the air, and the four dragon skulls flew to the throne and were impaled by its four legs. 
From that day on, Tark's bloodline were the rulers of the new realm, known as Shanatar. So, a couple of very important details here. Most of what is known about the throne and this ancient history comes from one book of collected oral history, so it's not entirely accurate. There is a copy of this book in Candlekeep and some additional notes that have been added over the years by many great sages. What follows is all that is currently known about the throne. Let's hit you with a bombshell right from the get-go, shall we? Don't mention this around any shield, shield wolves. They will absolutely beat the shit out of you for talking about this, but it is a fact. The bloodline of Tark Shanat, the ruling dynasty of Deep Shanatar, and the only line of dwarves who can access the full power of the Wormskull throne are now all Dwergar, Deep Dwarves. None of the people now known as Shield Dwarves can sit on that throne and use its, all its powers, and they absolutely must use one of the magical scepters of the kingdoms of Shanatar to do that safely. The fact that only Dwergar have the hereditary right to sit on the throne is absolute proof that they are all descended from a clan of dwarves who were enslaved and transformed by mind flayers in Deep Shanatar long, long ago. No living dwarf will ever admit that the Deep Dwarves are the rightful rulers of Shanatar. They consider them the enemy and usurpers of their ancient homelands, which is very sad that the bloodline of the Great Crusader should become so hated by all other dwarves. The Mind Flayer's evil is truly insidious, because it was the horrific centuries of slavery Clan Duergar endured under the Mind Flayers which transformed them into the Grey Dwarves. One could argue that Clan Duergar have always been a pack of bastards though, and you would be right, but nobody deserves what happened to them. Bright Axe Hall was carved out of the dead dragon's lair. It housed the Wormskull throne and had a lower chamber with nine statues, one of Tark and one for each of his eight sons. The far side of the hall was fully open to reveal the impressive view right across the great rift of Delnadar, and the site of the Delnadar span, the only bridge across the rift of Delnadar which stretched out for miles. Many people think it's built by dwarves, but it's far older than their civilization. From there, Tark's eight sons all went off to found their own kingdoms as part of the greater Shanatar region. Each of these kingdoms have their own magical scepter. Nobody knows when the scepters appeared, but it's likely they just popped out of the stone. More gifts from Dunathoin, right into the awestruck hands of each of Tark's offspring, who were all about a couple of centuries old by that stage, by my calculation. It's the scepters which are the traditional symbol of each king's authority with the shield dwarves, not crowns or axes or shields as many seem to think these days. Althorin and Bright Axe Hall remained the seat of ultimate authority for the clans of the shield dwarves, and within that city, the main worship was of Moradin and his wife, Berenar. But Tark's eight sons went off and founded eight other kingdoms, and each was worshipped a different child of Moradin and Berenar. The total area covered by these extended dwarven territories is fairly vast, beneath what is now known as the Lands of Intrigue, beneath the nations of Arm, Tether, Kalimshan, and the area covered by the Lake of Steam. Which, when you consider that this is not just the one level of the Underdark, it's a massive total of square miles of tunnels, seas, caverns, rivers and lakes, fungal forests and so on. The Shanatar region contains far more excavated tunnels and caverns than any of the dwarven lands far to the east in their original homelands. These many kingdoms are all exciting, but here is a brief overview of what they were like thousands of years ago and what their scepters looked like. Zotharan, known as the Adamant Kingdom, source of some of the most legendary giant slayers in history, housed in two massive caverns. The northern cavern is beneath the cloud peaks, and the southern cavern is beneath the small teeth mountains of Arm. The south is highly volcanic, and there is Azir blood mixed with the southern clan named Azurkin. The northern clan are the Black Banners, counting many great scholars among them. Thanks to a connecting tunnel network passing right beneath the Great Trackless Sea, the region was also home to some very aggressive scorpion folk, and the elemental portal to the south brought Ifrit, salamanders and other elementals. Now something many don't know is this kingdom worshipped the Lady of Healing, Mercy and Love, the goddess Sarindla, and the dwarves of Clan Azakin were a slim, spirited and lustful folk, with tempers to match their bright red hair. Rumours persist that most of their folk of that kingdom eventually settled in the Plain of Fire. The ruling scepter of Zon uh, Zontharin, like all the scepters, is shaped much like a heavy war club 
fashioned from mithril. The rounded shaft, as thick as a dwarf's forearm, is topped with a thick rounded disc and tapers down to end in a small knob, often with an inset jewel. The scepter is marked by the flaming needle symbol of Sarindla on one side and the mark of Zontherin on the other, and is currently clutched to the breast of a dwarf skeleton within the mouth of a cavern facing to the western outlook of the Far Sea Marshes high in the Stormhorn Mountains. The cavern is very still and cold. No wind or animal ever disturbs that place. Next is Old Toxamarin, known as the Zardazzle Kingdom, now long emptied of the clans that settled there and worshipped the god Dumathoin, who created the Worm Skull Throne. It's fitting, with a god of mining and secrets, that Old Toxamarin was located a mile beneath the Mount Serengard within the marching mountains in Kalimshan and the bordering forest of Mir. It is located in an impressive cavern with a ceiling over a thousand feet high. These days the realm is occupied by different races, the dwarves have long since departed. The ruling scepter of Old Toxamarin has the silhouette of a cut faceted gem inside of a mountain that is Dumathoin's holy symbol. It shimmers like a baldural within the firelight. The scepter is now thousands of miles from its home and now lies buried amid the rubble of Mythondas, ruins near the Great Glacier. Then we have Torglor, the Silver Kingdom, located beneath the Snowflake Mountains which border Arm and Tethir. So deep down it's actually part of the Middle Dark's layer of the Greater Underdark. This ruin was and probably still is a treasure trove of dwarven artifacts as the clans who lived there were the worshippers of the unusual dwarven god De Erinka, a evil god but wickedly clever when it comes to magic, trickery and cruelty. These clans almost never came up to the surface world and concerned themselves with the long fruitless war with the mind flayers of Arindal. Many weapons, still fully functional, bear the symbol of Torglor and the god De Erinka, a white swirling spiral. Towards the end of that kingdom's occupation of these caverns and tunnels, they had abandoned the worship of Derinka in favour of Dun the Dagmaran Brightmantle, and I suspect that they departed the realms through portals to other dimensions long ago. The ruling scepter of Torglor, with its swirling spiral symbol, has been the property of the Halruin noble family of Reselsa for more than 500 years, whose main stock and trade has been scholarship and sage law as well as magecraft. They guard this priceless artifact fiercely and will not part with it for even a dwarven king's riches. Karolnor is now a nation of trolls, sadly, but was once a great dwarven kingdom known as the Jewel Kingdom beneath the Troll Mountains on the northern border of the surface realm of Arm. It has an intricate network of tunnels and caverns at the border of the Upper Dark and the Middle Dark, which once contained several cities well known for incredibly fine stone masonry, actually. But there still stands an incredible dwarven statue 4,000 feet tall carved into the side of Mount Bartir in the Troll Mountains. The Karolnor dwarves were constantly defending their surface settlements and resources from giants and the cities have some truly exceptional stonework traps right out of the pages of Grimtooth's famous books on the subject. The dwarves there worshipped their brother of Derinka named uh, Dink. Karazan, a fairly insane demigod, nonetheless, the paranoia of the people of Karelnor was well justified, and it's true to say that they devoted their time to safety and security like it was a religion, because it was. The ruling scepter of Karelnor is marked with one of the last remaining examples of the symbol of uh, Dinkarazan, a ring of seven gems. What they signify? Nobody really knows. Also, where the scepter currently is? Nobody has any idea. Drakalor, the city of greed, was another thriving kingdom famed for its crafting and the bustling site of trade that accumulated huge wealth, but unfortunately fell victim to corruption and greed, which turned the place into a treacherous hive of backstabbing nobles and powerful assassin guilds dwelling under the Kuldin peaks of Tethir. The Chondathans of early Tether were very familiar with the dwarven surface town of Rinoroth, which means place over enemy land. In the dwarven tongue. It stands at one of the main access tunnels down to Dracolor, but has been abandoned, ruined for the last 124 years, occupied by quite a formidable red dragon named Charvekanathor. Charvek loves to beat up other dragons, eat as many orcs as he can find, and relax on his sunny spot with the commanding view of the nearby realms way up into the southwestern Kuldin Peaks. Oh, and of course, his treasure hoard does indeed contain the ruling scepter of Dracolor. 
The bejeweled dagger mark of the god Apathor identifies the Dracolor Scepter. Charvek's main rival, another red dragon worm named Balagos, often fights with him over this territory, and a great blue dragon named Ericlath Thagra waits for the day that she can take one or the other out when they weaken themselves enough for one in one of their stupid fights. Charvek is difficult to beat though. He has an alliance of convenience with a formerly blue draco lich named uh, Sephirachtar, who has been teaching Charvek magic for over a century now, patiently turning the great red dragon into an agent of the twisted rune. If you want to track down the location of any Gith Yankee actively hunting mind flayers in Faroon, the red dragons will know where they are, but good luck getting that information. Hodorarir, known as the Gold Kingdom, was a massive cavern realm in the middle of Deep Shanatar beneath the surface realm of Tethir. Its people built their houses in a large ring on the cavern walls and grew plenty of food on the lush farms and fields surrounding a central lake. All of the clans of the Shield Dwarves had houses there and it was a true melting pot of ideas and cultural exchange from all the different kingdoms, flowing along with the constant outpouring of food exported all across of Shanatar mainly a golden variety of lake kelp and all sorts of excellent cultivated mushrooms. The ruling scepter of Holarara also serves as the scepter of Barakur, carries the shield symbol of Ladagur, the Dwergar deity, and the scepter is currently in the hands of the war king Olorn Ridagur, the Dwergar ruler of Underspires. He cannot tr access any powers beyond using it as a magical club, however, he is the last of the direct line, bloodline of Tark Shanet, 100 generations later. But even so, the magic of the throne should still hold true. Barakur, known as the Iron Kingdom, was dominated by the shield dwarf clan Duergar, destined to be cut off from the other dwarven kingdoms and conquered by mind flayers, who, over thousands of years of slavery, transformed clan Duergar's descendants into the Duergar subrace, also known as Grey or Deep Dwarves. But, Five and a half thousand years ago, the Dwergar rebelled against the Mind Flayers and liberated themselves, creating new settlements further north beneath the Oars Run Mountains and also directly beneath the Great Glacier. Long before the Mind Flayers enslaved them, though, the clan Dwergar were a pack of bastards. Barakur originally housed families of many clans, but they left for other places as clan Dwergar became increasingly tyrannical. Even in its earliest centuries, Barakur had a fierce rivalry with the neighbouring kingdoms of Dracolor and Ultric Salmon, which were the closest neighbours, and this erupted into open warfare during a terrible period known as the Spawn Wars, ten and a half centuries ago, where these monsters known as Deep Spawn were bred and used to create clone armies of dwarves, clones slaughtering clones with the original dwarves commanding their bloodthirsty campaigns from their impregnable fortifications. Of course, the dwarven enemies, the Mind Flayers and Drow, took advantage of these conflicts and struck at the very heart of Shanatar, attacking Alatorin and taking the Wormskull throne. Shocking the dwarven subkingdomsmen to finally unifying and taking back Alatorin in what is called the Second Spider War, at the end of which Barakur's inhabitants believed that Clan Duergar's king had the strongest claim to the throne of Shanatar, but he was denied and Barakur once more withdrew from the affairs of Shanatar a bitter and despotic realm doomed to its fate. Sondar, also known as the Sea Star Kingdom, venerated the god Vergadane, the Merchant King, a god of luck, trickery, negotiation, sneaky dealings and wealth. Sondar was a city that bred merchants and was famed for its trade in exotic spices of the Underdark and surface world. It was some strange twists of fate that meant that the ruling scepter of this long-lost kingdom should always be associated with spice trading in some small way, which is how it eventually came to light during a bar brawl in the Blue Badger Inn in the village of Torel, Torelth in northeastern Tethera involving three adventuring bands, the Shield of the Highlands, the Company of the Anvil, and three companions, Sorum Battlebellow, Odak Truesteel and Baffar of Clan Gelmrin, who was on a quest to find the Wormscale throne. The ruling scepter of Sonda had been taken from the tomb of a distant cousin to one of the last rulers of Shanatar, but it attracted the attention of the cowled wizards of Arm, who alerted Clan Gelm Gelmrin in the first place, leading to their bar brawl and to it being stolen, teleported away by a sea elf king of all people. 
who was in possession of the Wormscale Throne at the time. This is all covered in an old adventure module called the Wormscale Throne, set a long time before the throne showed up again in the campaign book Storm King's Thunder. Iltkazar, known as the Mithril Kingdom, is famous for its stone carvings and fantastic engineering. It's probably one of the most heavily fortified and best defended cities in the Underdark and is still inhabited. Its territory currently includes the locations of the old kingdoms of Barakur, Dracolor, and Horalarar, Old Truxamon, and Zokia, City of Orbs. The ruling scepter of Ilkazir is the crossed axe symbol of the god Klagendin, the father of battle. Unfortunately, the scepter is currently in possession of the Morkoth named Axar Zyril, somewhere in the Sea of Fallen Stars. The scepter of High Shanatar appeared later than the others once the dwarves established cities on the surface of the third great era of Shanatar in 7,616 years ago. The scepter of High Shanatar bears the symbol of Thad Har, the Disentangler, two crossed scaled metal gauntlets ending in claws. Although primarily viewed as the patron of jungle dwarves, Thad Har was venerated by the deep dwelling shield dwarves of Shanatar as the lord of the green mantle, the god of the forests above. Thus, High Shanatar was established as his domain. In addition, as the Disentangler was numbered as the ninth of the nine scions of the forge, it was appropriate that the ninth kingdom scepter bear Thadhar's symbol. Then High Shanatar fell at the hands of the humans of Kalimshan 4096 years ago. More Pashas stole than murdered to claim the scepter than any treasure since the claiming of the seven scimitars of Shamatar. Today, it lies beneath the surf's edge buried among the dried bone beaches of Thor Den Tor, among the Nilanthar Isles. The Alatoran Scepter, kind of the one ring of the ruling scepters, is easily distinguished from the others in direct comparison due to its darker, more reflective star metal surface. The holy mark the scepter carries is the hammer and anvil mark of Moradin, the Dwarf Father. It was this mark on the scepter that rules them all that ended the factionalized clan god structures and unified the worship of all the dwarven gods as a pantheon called uh, the Morden Sanan, unified under Shanatar. While the scepter carries and shares the same powers as are the other ruling scepters, it also has three special powers with its star metal form. If the scepter is placed in the right armrest of the Wormscale throne, or held while seated in the throne, the seated figure mentally receives all the command words of the throne and, and the powers of the throne. If within 500 feet of the Wormscale throne, the wield of the Ella Torin Scepter can activate and use the powers of the throne at a distance, operating its powers by remote control. This is particularly important for the last power that the throne has. The scepter can only command the powers of the throne once the command words are known, so the scepter wielder must have sat on the throne at least once to gain that knowledge. With one command word that has never been spoken aloud, the Alatoran Scepter has the power to actually call the Wormscale Throne to its location. The sea elf tyrant Ganthar Kroak recovered the Scepter from a shipwreck among the haunted plains early in the 11th Seros War, and he wielded it proudly as a weapon of choice through that conflict for two centuries before ever learning of its true powers and legacy, which he saw as a means to further his plans of reforming the ruling class of sea elves and the Wormscale Throne and its ruling scepter had been his best tools for manipulating surface folk to help him achieve that goal. But he was brought down by a bunch of adventurers, of course, and the throne was sold to the storm giantess Neri for a considerable fortune, because she already owned the scepter of Elder Torin, which she had found in a shipwreck at the bottom of the trackless sea. Once she had the complete set, you could say, Neri had the throne magically enlarged and gave it to her husband, King Hecaton, as a gift. Only a creature attuned to the ruling scepter and in possession of it can harness the powers of the Wormscale throne, which has become the centerpiece of King Hecaton's throne room in the undersea citadel of Maelstrom. Fear of the throne's power has helped prevent evil giants from challenging or threatening Hecaton's leadership ever since. All of the scepters have multiple magical powers, as does the throne, so let's learn what they are, or I will end up talking about ancient dwarven history for the rest of the day. This information on the artifacts is much more detailed and accurate than you will find in the book titled Of the Clans and Clashes of Shanatar, written in the early 12th century Dale Reckoning by the dwarven scholar uh, Brith Tolar of Clan Ironhelm in Mirabar. So here goes. The scepters all share a set of common powers and properties. 
They can be used as clubs, though they deal more damage than the average club, and if wielded um, as within 100 feet of the Wormscale Throne, the magical damage bonus rises to plus 6 points, and this power is constant. With the knowledge of the other 10 scepters, the owner can perform one sending per day to each of the other scepters by a mental command. The holder of the scepter can receive the sending directly into their mind silently or have it broadcast aloud from the scepter. And if no one is in contact with it, the message automatically broadcasts audibly for anyone to hear. Another command word causes the scepter to glow, radiating a globe of energy, which then contracts into the scepter, causing all within the globe to disappear. This globe uh, extends to 20 foot 5 radius from the scepter and all living things and anything they carry on their bodies within that radius are teleported without error to within a 50 foot radius of the Wormscale throne. Given the stone's flight capability, the kings of Shanatar only use this power after sending to the Altoran scepter for permission to enter the Emperor's presence. They don't want to appear in midair. This power can be used up to once per 10 days. The Wormscale throne also homes in on the scepters and each of them chimes like a bell when they get pinged by the throne. Okay, so what are the powers of the actual throne? If someone of the bloodline of Tark Shanat touches the throne, they receive knowledge of all the artifacts command words instantly. As mentioned, the only people still of that bloodline are all Dwegar, so it's most likely anyone unaware of this requirement will also be unaware that a ruling scepter is also required, otherwise touching the throne is going to trigger the usurper's field. This powerful force field raises the, and permeates the whole volume, paralyzing the usurper against the throne and allowing no speech or any movement beyond breathing. Someone outside of the field can attempt to transport them via magic, or if the person is wearing a ring of free action, hopefully, they can make a save against the paralysis to leap away from the field, otherwise they will be stuck there and it will remain active until the ruling scepter is used to switch it off. If someone owning a ruling scepter who knows how to use one sits on the throne, they can command the throne to hover a foot above any surface and fly around at will. They can also fly into solid stone, phasing into it and moving around like an earth elemental with no ill effect as long as they care to. They may command the throne to teleport to within 50 yards of any other ruling scepter, unless the scepter has been moved to another dimension or other plane of existence of course. The following powers can only be used by a Dwaga who is holding the Altoran scepter or has slotted it into the armrest of the throne. They can teleport someone holding one or other of the ruling scepters back to the location the scepter holder just teleported from. They can command the dragon skulls to shoot bolts of lightning twice per day, so eight bolts in total. But the most powerful ability of the dragon is the dragon field manifestation where a massive blue dragon forms out of the force field energy surrounding the throne, and for all practical considerations, from a gaming point of view, the occupant of the throne is now piloting a force energy based dragon body 200 feet long and 80 feet tall for a total of 10 rounds during the day. It's very impressive and can be highly destructive, and of course as I mentioned, they can also do that remotely. Talking of destruction, the only way to destroy the Wormscale throne is by breaking at least five of the ten ruling scepters simultaneously over the throne, which will cause the throne to explode catastrophically, lethal to most beings within 20 feet. Only those 60 feet away from the throne can even make a saving throw or suffer the full damage. If a drow sits on the throne, the throne shatters instantly to destroy the drow, but then reforms within a day unless blasted by Blue Dragon's Breath. This action nearly occurred during the fall of Alatorin, as a drow sacrificed her life to break the throne, and then her allied dragons blasted the pieces into the Great Breach, also known as the Rift of Delnada. The pieces reformed due to the equal sacrifice of the great-grandson of Tark Shanat, who'd leapt after the shattered throne, and whose lifeblood restored the throne as it lay in rubble far below. So, there we have it. The Dwarves of the Forgotten Realms have an ancient and incredibly rich history. It was a delight to delve deep into the earliest era of the origin of the Shield Dwarves and the Dwagar. Thanks to a viewer request from Chris for this topic. I'm happy to help. As always, thanks for listening, and I'll be back with more for you very soon.